Protesters in Sudan are counting their dead after a brutal crackdown by security forces. A doctor's group says at least 35 people were killed when troops attacked demonstrators on Monday. Now, the country's de facto military leader says the violence is regrettable and he is calling for elections within nine months. In ends, David McGenzie has more on the bloodshed. A warning, some of his report includes graphic images. A new day in Sudan's dangerous impasse. Ushered in by gunfire and screams, the brutality streamed live on social media by protesters who for weeks had peacefully demanded civilian rule. Now desperately recording the security forces' deadly response. They killed someone, they killed someone. The man filming shouts, a civilian lies unresponsive. In the chaos, the cameraman flees for his life. Witnesses and opposition groups tell CNN that the paramilitary rapid security force led the crackdown. In this video filmed by a witness, you see a car stopped by security forces, the occupants inside beaten mercilessly. Despite these images, Sudan's transitional military council claimed that they did not disperse the sitting by force. The council has been negotiating with opposition groups for weeks. Since Sudan's longtime strongman Omar al-Bashir was ousted in late April, the biggest sticking point, what role civilians will have in leading the country forward. In the face of such violence, opposition groups have suspended those talks, calling for a nationwide strike and more defiance. In the capital city's hospitals, full of the wounded, hope for a peaceful power-sharing agreement replaced. They try to frighten us with bullets, one injured man is heard saying, we need leadership, we need leadership, the peace has ended now after this bitterness. Among those killed, an eight-year-old child, according to a doctor's group. They say more than 100 injured are crammed into city hospitals, some with gunshot wounds, others badly beaten. It is feared the death toll will rise. David McKenzie, CNN. Well, earlier I spoke to the British ambassador to Sudan, Irfan Siddiq, via Skype from Khartoum. Now, I have to tell you, it was a real challenge to get it up as the government are making communications extremely difficult. My team against the odds going uh, for it for you. And I began by asking Mr Sadiq about how that crackdown played out. So there was loud gunfire that erupted at around five o'clock in the morning yesterday. It woke me from my sleep very close to the, the residence and the uh, compound of the British Embassy. It seems that uh, all of the witnesses are saying that these were troops of the rapid support forces who were uh, assaulting the, the protest site. And that's what led to the, the violence and the killings and also the fear for normal people to go about their, their normal movements around the town. So has a sense of normalcy returned to the city? What, what's the situation now? No, the city is far from normal. I've just been out for some uh, meetings, including with the military council. And uh, it's a little, I mean, today's, by some accounts, the first day of Eid, the, the formal Eid in Sudan will take place tomorrow, but it's very quiet. Uh, there are informal barricades and roadblocks strewn all over the city. There are very few people out. Shops are all closed, so it's far from normal. What leverage does the UK and other international uh, community members have on the Transitional Military Council to prevent the violence from happening again? Well, there's no guarantee that the, the, the violence won't happen again, but we're using all of the efforts at our disposal to try to ensure that there's no repeat. The African Union is leading on the negotiations, the support to the negotiations for the formation of a transitional civilian government. And they've made clear that the AU will suspend Sudan from membership of the African Union by the end of this month if that civilian government isn't in place. Similarly, the key Western countries who uh, own most of Sudan's debt, and particularly the US, uh, who have listed Sudan as a state sponsor of terrorism, we have a very strong uh, and powerful role to play in helping Sudan normalize its economy and helping it get through the economic crisis that it's still facing despite the, the change of leadership at the top. And if Sudan wants the support of the international community, I think it needs to stop this violence and it needs to work to ensure that this transition to civilian rule happens as, as soon as possible. Are you confident that that is going to happen, that a democratic transition? 
So the Military Council announced this morning that it was suspending all talks with the Freedom and Change Forces and annulling all of the agreements they'd reached so far. They will be calling for elections to be held within nine months. This is obviously a unilateral step which will not help leading to a, an agreed outcome. So in a meeting with the Military Council that I just had, along with other diplomatic representatives, we made very clear that the, the Military Council needed to avoid unilateral steps. They needed to ensure that any outcome for the political uh, agreement was an agreed outcome, something that had you know, wide-ranging support, consensual support, and one that wouldn't lead to further divisions and polarization. Uh, I was a bit surprised but pleased to hear from the Military Council that they would be open to resume negotiations, despite the fact that the head of the Military Council had said this morning that they were off and that they would be holding elections in nine months. And he also said that they would be willing to Are reconsider you? holding elections within nine months. Would all parties and major players have a chance to prepare for those elections? That sounds like a pretty short time frame, doesn't it? Absolutely. And that's one of the points that we made that wasn't really credible, given the mm. context, to expect free and fair elections to be held within nine months. There's a huge amount of restructuring of the state, of dismantling of the uh, elements of the former regime. There's a huge inbuilt advantage for uh, those linked to the former regime. There are issues of peace and conflict that need to be resolved, uh, as well as economic stabilization. And then simply there's the logistical challenge of holding elections in a country that has been uh, riven by conflict, that has been economically marginalized, and that really isn't in a good state to, to hold elections. So I think there's huge question marks about the credibility of the proposal to hold elections within nine months. Are you concerned about the influence of other regional stakeholders at this point? So there's been a lot of speculation that this uh, crackdown on the protest site and this unilateral declaration by the Military Council came soon after a regional tour by the head of the Military Council and his deputy, particularly to Gulf states like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And there's a concern that there may have been some sort of implicit green light given to this, this action that we've seen. In my own discussions with representatives of those countries, they've been clear that they want to support a transition to civilian rule uh, and, and do not support, support unilateral action. So I hope that the, there hasn't been this message and that all actors, all international and regional actors, work to build stability uh, in Sudan. These actions that we've seen over the last uh, 24 hours and the, the unilateral statement by the military council will not help build stability in Sudan.